guys. Let's try that again. Good morning. It is so good to see you. Welcome to Redeemer Church. Just a few quick announcements and then uh, we are going to get kicked off into worship. Number one, as you saw, we did have Camp Redeemer this last week and we had a phenomenal week. Um, it is so much joy for me to sit down and watch our, our teachers and our leaders invest in the lives of, of children. Gosh, we had so much fun. And it's fun, you know, some of those kids are really good with a zone defense and some of them need more of a man-to-man -man defense, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> And so those are my favorite kids, the man-to-man, -man, because I was always a man-to-man -man defense type of kid. Um, so thank you for, um, for giving of time and, and finances and supplies and all of those things to invest in your community and ultimately to tell children about Jesus. We are so thankful for that. Um, number two, I wanted to let you know that we know that one of our primary needs as a church is to build relationship and community. And so because of that, um, we have a few things um, kind of in the future that we want to do together. But one of those things that I want you to be thinking about, about how you can be plugged in and involved, and also maybe suggest to me a few things that might be fun, is we want to do a church-wide um, to use an old term, fall festival. We want to do a hayride. We want to play some wiffle ball and kickball at the park. We just want to have some fun and hang out together. Of course, we're going to eat because you can't have any church gathering without food, right? And so um, we'll call it breaking bread together, okay? So we can uh, really class it up. So all that to say, here's what I need from you. Number one, we need your involvement. We need your attendance because here's why we're doing it. We're doing it so that you can build relationships with other people because we do have a large number of people, way larger than we ever dreamed of, um, 13, 14 weeks in. And, and so because of that, we realized that, gosh, people are calling this their church home, but they don't even know the person that sits next to them. And so number one, if you haven't introduced yourself to the person next to you, just say hi. It's okay, right? There you go. Shaking hands, hugging necks, whatever we're doing. Number two, we think that community is one of the most important things. Here's what we know statistically. People for the first three to five weeks will attend a church because of great music or great preaching. And after that, they attend because of relationship, that they have found community. There was a reason why the disciples did everything and went everywhere together. Because Jesus knew ultimately in order to capture their heart that they were going to have to do life together. And it's the same way that he um, wants the church to act today. In Acts chapter 2, it tells us that the early church had all things in common, that they were of one accord. And that does not mean they all fit in a Honda, right? That's totally different. So, because that was a really corny joke. That deserves a good laugh, right? So, because of that, here's what I want to encourage you to do. Be looking forward to that. We'll give you dates in a couple weeks. But I want you to be thinking, how can I be actively plugged into that? And what can I do to help? Because I just want, to, want you to remember... You are not a, an attender of Redeemer Church. You are Redeemer Church. This is your church. And so we need you to be involved. So um, with that, I'm going to call Zandy up. He's going to talk to us about some about student ministry. Thank you for doing that, brother. Um, thank you for investing in our teams. We love it. Well, they were probably curious uh, after a week at youth camp. I wasn't here last Sunday. They were probably thinking, probably just buried him there. Um, I did survive. Just barely. But... No, it was awesome. Um, talked to my parents this week because a lot of you, if you didn't know, we took 21 students and five adults and invaded my parents' farm uh, down in south, south central Missouri. Uh, and it was their first week of retirement. I mean, working. <laughs> yeah. Uh, first, uh, first week of retirement. And so they didn't take a bit of it off. Uh, I talked to them this week and they actually said, when are you bringing them back? Um, they loved having them there. The students were awesome, um, had a really good time, just uh, really bonding as a group and, and becoming one group. So uh, it, was, it was phenomenal. Well, I've been reached, uh, reached out to by several of you wondering, hey, if I was interested in getting involved in the student ministry, how would I do that? So if, if that's you, if you're curious, okay, we're going to start youth group meetings. We're hoping right after Labor Day. Um, the 5th is that first Wednesday. That's the tentative start date uh, for starting midweek uh, youth group meetings. Uh, we're going to be meeting over at the Y. Basically, if you took kids to VBS this week, we're probably going to be in that same room. And uh, so anyway, we're excited about that location, being close to the school. Um, but we're going to have a short student ministry team meeting all that out. Uh, next week, right after service, it's going to be a very short meeting. I'm thinking 15, 20 minutes. 
you know, and we're just going to kind of talk about the vision of the student ministry and what potentially your involvement could be. Uh, we're going to need small group leaders. We're going to need uh, activity leaders and things like that. We want this to be a very um, active and eventful and fruitful ministry. So uh, if you're interested at all in student ministry, please uh, plan on attending immediately following the service. We'll probably meet right up front here and just uh, answer a few questions. Have a, have a few sheets to hand out to you to give you some information. Thank you so much. Let's worship our Lord and Savior. All right, y'all can stand up. Let's worship. Before we get into it, let's pray. Lord, uh, thank you for uh, being here this morning, being able to gather with other believers to worship you. I pray that what comes out of our mouth would be from our heart. And uh, Lord, may you be honored this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Psalm 73, I was reading this week, and uh, Asaph is struggling. He's seeing the, uh, the hard things in the world. He's seeing the wicked prosper. He's seeing things that he doesn't like, and it's causing him to stumble in his relationship with the Lord. And he goes and he says, I then went into the sanctuary of God, and I pondered these things. And he said, then I realized and what their end was. And he basically got perspective at that point. And then he gets into verse 21. He says, When my heart was embittered and I was pierced within, then I was senseless and ignorant. I was like a beast before you. He says, Nevertheless, I am continually with you. You have taken hold of my right hand. With your counsel you will guide me and afterward receive me to glory. And so that's, that's our end as believers, is that we're going to be received into, into glory, that the, the craziness in this world is not going to continue for the believer. And um, so we can rejoice in that. We're going to sing I'll Fly Away this morning, and let's just rejoice in, in the fact that we are, we're going to escape the craziness of this world.
You're the only one who is worthy of our worship. There's nothing else uh, that is more precious or more valuable um, than you. And so, Lord, we pray that this morning we would count all things lost uh, for the sake of knowing you, Jesus. May you be seen through uh, our, the next few minutes we have with each other. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, can you see? So we are uh, beginning our second week of our um, Choose This Day sermon series. And last week, we talked about choosing purpose over popularity. And for those of you that are people pleasers like I am, that's difficult. It's difficult to remember that God has called you to a purpose much more than he has called you to be liked. Amen? And that's hard. It's hard sometimes. And so uh, today we're going to talk about something I believe that if you will um, open up your hearts to, that God will use to absolutely transform your life. Um, we are going to talk about the idea of choosing surrender over control. Anybody here a control freak? Just raise your hand. Remember, just like last week, um, if you're a control freak, go ahead and raise the hand of the person next to you because that's what you do. And... Uh, as we're doing that, hey, I, I just want to let you know that I'm not a control freak in almost any area of life other than usually in church. And um, I love the fact that we have amazing, amazing people that serve in capacities. I, I just want to let you know, remember our ministry model here at Redeemer is um, as long as the Lord allows, uh, we don't want to have any paid staff. We just want to invest in our community and invest in people. And we have a plan to do that. We're so excited. Um, but that means that we have some volunteers who are going above and beyond in time and leadership. And so here's an area that I would like for you to pray about. Um, right now, we have somewhere between 55 and 60 children in Redeemer Kids. Um, that's awesome. Yeah, you can for it. That's great. Um, we're 14 weeks old. We don't have the leadership. I mean, we do. Please don't, please don't hear me wrong. Like, don't run over there and go, my kids, you're fine. We're on them. I mean, this is zone defense, baby. We're right. Remember, we even have a few man-to-man. -man. It's okay. Like, everything's good. Lots of adults over there. But here's the deal. Again, this is our church. And so we want you to be actively involved in serving in your church. And so here's what that means. Um, if, if you are a committed follower of Jesus and you've done church before and you know what it looks like to do children's ministry, we would love to have you involved. Maybe you don't know what it looks like to do children's ministry, but you are willing and able. Here's the amazing thing. Our directors are so good at what they do that they have multiple outlines for every class every week that they write themselves. We don't even use other people's curriculum. We write it ourselves. And they have it set up so much so that if you are a master teacher type person and you can walk into that classroom and you can teach kids and you're like the Pied Piper and they just look at you and they're engaged and they're, they're still and, you know, like normally happens with kids. <laughs> Maybe you're that type of person and, uh, gosh, you don't need that at all and you're good. Well, praise Jesus for you. And then maybe if you're like most where kids scare the snot out of you like they should. <laughs> they even have... They even write out the prayers. They want you to feel equipped. They want you to know that you don't have to come up with anything on your own. God will use you. You don't have to be scared. We have great resources in your hand. We have great leadership to help you in that. But we need some help, I think. Because I just want to tell you what I've been telling our core team for weeks now. This is the summer slump. This is when people don't go to church and they take last minute vacations. This, as I've spoken to most churches in the area, is when their attendance is down 20 to 30 percent. And we have almost 60 kids in Redeemer Kids. Guess what's going to happen when September comes and October comes? So we want to be prepared for that. The other thing we do not want to do is have the same leadership in there every week where they don't get to be involved in corporate worship over here. That's the worst thing you can ever do in a church. And so, all that said, would you pray about your involvement? Please, pray about your involvement. We've got enough staff over there right now. I don't want those same staff to have to be in there for the next 12 weeks. And so, anyway, with that said, we are so glad you're here. Let's go ahead and get started this morning. So we're talking about the idea of choosing surrender over control. The idea that God would call us to be people 
that surrender rather than try and control everything. And as we just talked about, some of you are control freaks and you have a hard time with that. And in fact, if you're anything like me, there may have been times in your life where you have almost audibly heard the voice of the Lord telling you, I want you to let go of that. And rather than being obedient, you have said no. That is a dangerous thing to do with a holy God. But we do it all the time. And in fact, it's not just in our timeline that we do this. All throughout the course of history, people have said no to God in order to say yes to themselves. And this morning, I want to look with you at one of the most fascinating periods of all time. Um, we are going to look back at the history of the Jewish kings. And uh, you find this in First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles. These accounts of these Jewish kings who were in control. And if you've ever read through some of those books, they're amazing accounts. I don't want to call them stories because they actually did happen. They're not stories. They're, they're actually literal accounts of what took place. They're historical. You can look them up in actual history. And these Jewish kings, man, they did some amazing things. But there comes a point where you hear about the ninth guy say the same thing. And God tells them to do the same thing. And they're disobedient. Where you're just thinking, I need to get to the New Testament and to Jesus, right? I need to get to Jesus. Don't miss this morning the truth that we find in the words of Scripture as we look at some of these Jewish kings, one in particular. Don't miss the fact that all Scripture is useful and God-breathed. It is there for a reason. It is there so that God might use it to speak to us and transform our lives. And so here's what you had going on um, during the time of these Jewish kings. Before this period, um, the nation of Israel had no kings. In fact, um, for a 500-year period, they had no king at all. God had set up a system with them where he told them this. You don't need a king because I am your king. And that's a good king to have, right? God is a good king to have. And he said, I am your king. If you will listen to me, if you will be obedient to me, if you will follow me, I will make sure that you are taken care of, that you are provided for, and that you are given good direction to prosper in the land. There was just one problem. A lot like us, the Israelites, they didn't do real well with God telling them what to do, right? Yeah. Anyone here have an authority issue? Absolutely. Don't point at your husband. It's not worth it. But authority issues are a big deal. And so um, the Israelites kept saying, we need a king. And so here's what happened. The Israelites finally got together and they had leadership go to a prophet by the name of Samuel. And they said, Samuel, we need a king. You have to give us a king. And Samuel said, you don't need a king. God is your king. You don't want a king because you want to know what kings do. They act like kings. Kings are prideful. They make choices that honor themselves rather than the Lord. They choose not to bow in submission to God. Kings are also flawed, broken, sinful human beings, right? I don't know about you, but I make bad choices all the time. And that's what these kings did. In fact, um, for about a course of 300 years, um, we see example after example after example of these kings making horrible choices, including a guy by the name of David, who we know was a king after God's own heart. Even he made horrible choices, didn't he? And led the people in disarray at times. Absolutely. And so Samuel says, you don't want a king. They impose taxes. They involve you in wars. They make horrible, horrible choices. But the people said, we want to be like all the other nations when we're walking around town, when we go to the mall. Come on, Samuel, when we all go to the mall and we're hanging out and our friends are like, hey, who's your king? And they're like, God. You know, they have an actual king, right? We, we want a king. We want an actual king who reigns on high. And he says, okay. All right. Have your king. And they've got this bad line of kings for 300 years. They make laws. They break laws. Because, guess what kings want to be? If you go to this first slide here. Maybe. <laughs> Let me show you what's happening here. This is the nation of Israel. And if you didn't know, nation Israel was divided into a northern kingdom named Israel and a southern kingdom by the name of Judah. And what we're going to talk about this morning all took place in the southern kingdom of Judah because right here, if you can't see it, I should have a little pointer, shouldn't I? And then I would point at your eyes. Right here, that little star right there 
is the town of Jerusalem, kind of an important town, right? Right on the northern portion of the southern kingdom. And this morning we're going to talk about a king that reigned in Jerusalem. But as kings do, kings have um, a really, really, really bad, uh, gosh, they, they, there's no better way to say it. If you put up this next slide here. Oh, it got lost. That's my fault, not hers. Kings want to be autonomous. Kings want to do things based on their own. They don't want to be part of leading someone where someone else is telling them what to do. They want to have autonomy. They do not want for a hierarchy to be above them. That's why they love being king. And so what happens is kings don't wrap their head around the idea of what it means to be servant to anyone else, especially a god who has placed them in power. And one of the things that we find happening here in the course of kings, uh, kings is that one guiding principle shows itself over and over and over, and that is this. That ultimately, if you rebel against God, if there is rebellion in your life, whether you are a king or simply a servant, that in your life it will equal pain. Would anyone say that they've ever lived this out where they've rebelled against the Lord and it's caused them pain? Lots of us, right? We've all seen this, this happen. These kings, over and over and over, can't wrap their head around the idea that rebellion in your life ultimately is going to hurt. It is going to cause you pain. But it's something that we can relate to, right? We understand this. You understand in your life that we all, at times, we want to be king. We want to do things our way. Does anyone remember that old song, It's Good to Be King? Do you guys remember that song? To have your own world, to have your own way, to do things the way that you want to do them. I have an 11-year-old boy who wants to be king. In fact, I don't know. Your kids have probably never said this at all. But every time I tell my wonderful son, Javik, anything about life, about rules, direction, two words come out of his mouth. The first one is I, and the second one is, that's right, I know. You guys have 11-year-olds too. I know. He says, I know. And the reason he knows is because he is so smart. Do you realize my 11-year-old is smarter than any of you? He is. I know it because he's told me so many times. I know. I know what you're going to say, Dad. I know what you're thinking. I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. I know. We want to do what we want to do. We don't like it when other people tell us what to do. In fact, it's really easy for us here in a second. We're going to look at Scripture, and you're going to look at this account, and you're going to say... Man, that king was a moron. How in the world? But I want you to think about all the times where you have caused yourself and your family pain because you knew what was best for you rather than surrendering to what God says is best for you. That's what we do because we all, at some point, want to be king. But if we violate, if we violate the rules, it causes us Pain. Now here's the kicker. As we look at this king, um, as we look at this southern kingdom of Israel, as we look at Judah, what we're going to find is this. Um, people make bad choices and they continue to make bad choices. And a lot of times they continue to make bad choices until someone warns them, this is your final chance. This is the final thing that you can do. And in fact, um, here's what we know about this guy by the name of King Zedekiah. That's what we're going to look at today. We're going to look at a king by the name of Zedekiah. Zedekiah, um, throughout the course of his kingship, which was not very long, made some really bad choices. In fact, he ended up being the final king of Judah. He ended up being the last one. And you say, how did that happen? Well, what happened is he didn't know that God wasn't going to say one Two, three, right? Because that's how your kids know when you're serious, when you get to three, right? In our family, we say that's how many spankings you get, and we count by tens, all right? So 10, 70, 400, like we just start big, we just go. A lot of times we want God to do that with us. With God, we know you're serious, we know you told us to do something, and so God, would you go ahead and count to three? Because I don't actually want to listen to you the first time, I want you to get to three. 
So God, I know that I've been disobedient in this area, and you said one, and I'm really like one, but two's probably okay too. And, and God, you should give me at least three strikes, right? It's three strikes and you're out. I don't have to listen the first time because you're just God. And so I'm just waiting until you get to three. Well, Zedekiah was waiting for God to count to three. God did not count to three. And because of that, what we know about Zedekiah was he was the last king in this lineage of kings in the southern kingdom in Judah. Maybe it would have been different if God had counted to three. Can I ask you something? Would your life look differently right now if every time God told you to do something, he counted out loud to three when you didn't? He said, you know what? I want you to quit hanging out with that person. And you said, okay, God. But I think I can change him. One. I want you to put surrounding yourself with that person. Bad company corrupts good character. They don't have any place in your life at this stage. But God, if you just allow me to hang around him a little longer, I can not only change them, but I can change all the people that we hang out with. They have such potential. Two. God, I don't think you understand. I know their heart. And God says, oh, oh, you know their heart? Three. That's not normally the way it works, is it? God tells us to do something and then we don't. And guess what? There's consequences because of our choices. And it's not because God is mad at us. It's because ultimately he wants to capture our heart. And so he doesn't count one, two, three all the time. Sometimes he simply just says, I want you to do. And then imagine this actually expects us to do it. So if you have your Bibles, you're going to want to grab those. You're going to want to open them up to the book of 2 Chronicles. We're not going to turn there just yet. But you're going to want to put your finger there in 2 Chronicles. We're going to be in verse 36, and, and, and then we're going to jump through a few verses of Scripture here. So, here's what happened. As you're talking about King Zedekiah, you might ask, how did this guy come into power? Well, here's what took place. There was a king by the name of Jehoiakim, and Jehoiakim made some bad choices. Some really bad choices. And uh, one of the things that he did was he hacked off a guy by the name of King Nebuchadnezzar. Anyone ever heard of King Nebuchadnezzar? And uh, King Nebuchadnezzar got, got mad. And uh, here's what he did. He went down to Judah. He went down to the southern kingdom of Israel. And he came and, and he got Joachim. And he said, here, you're coming with me. His people captured him. They took the southern kingdom, Judah. They, they took them into captivity. In fact, uh, what they did was they took Jehoiakim up. And he put him in what was called a king's court. You know, like some people collect stamps or baseball cards or, or antiques and collectibles. Guess what Nebuchadnezzar collected? Kings. This is actual history. You can look this up. He took Jehoiakim and he put him in what was called his king's court. And these were kings of nations that he had captured and he chained them together and then when he would have all his friends over for dinner he'd make the kings come out and they were like court jesters they would dance and sing and act so that they could entertain all of his company it showed his great power his great authority and it absolutely decimated the character of the kings and other nations and so he had captured Joachim he had brought him up he had placed him in his king's court and now here's what took place in 597 B.C., okay, the temple is destroyed. King Nebuchadnezzar goes, he takes Jehoiakim, he puts him in his king's court, and then he comes back and he says, guess what? You guys can have a king, that's fine, but I'm going to appoint the king. I'm going to do it. And so I'm going to appoint this guy named Zedekiah. And Zedekiah was 21 years old. Can you imagine being king of a nation when you're 21? He didn't know any better not to do it, right? He's like, you're going to make me king? Yeah, absolutely, I'm going to make you king. Because Nebuchadnezzar knew who to pick on. Someone with no, no wisdom or experience. He said, sure, you're going to be king. So Zedekiah, you're going to be king. So he picks him to be king. And here's why he wants him to be king. Because 
But Babylon had turned Judah, especially Jerusalem, into a vassal state. And a vassal state is someone that is required to pay taxes to the person it's in captivity to. And so uh, Judah had to pay taxes to Babylon. And as a vassal state, Nebuchadnezzar ultimately ruled over all of them. But he allowed them a king so that it kept the people docile. He didn't want them feeling like they had to revolt against him. So he said, hey, you're just fine. You've still got your land. You've still got your homes. You actually still have a king. You're totally fine. Everything's good. It's going to be this guy, Zedekiah. And here is what he tells Zedekiah. He says this. He says, I got three rules for you. Number one, I do not want you to raise an army. Why would he not want Zedekiah to raise an army? Because he didn't want anyone fighting against him. So he says, here's what you're going to do. You're not going to raise an army because I want you to be susceptible and vulnerable at any time. Number two, I want you to keep sending those taxes up to me. If you don't keep paying, you're in trouble. And finally, I don't want you to repair the walls that guarded your city that I tore down. Leave them down so that I can get to you any time I want. And Nebuchadnezzar puts Zedekiah into place. And Zedekiah says, okay, we're going to be just fine. But somewhere along the way, in Zedekiah's life, he forgot what he was supposed to do. And he started saying this. But hold on a second. I'm king. And that is where we pick up with the story. Now here's what's happening in Zedekiah's life. There's a prophet by the name of Jeremiah. You guys have heard of Jeremiah. He actually wrote a book. It's called the book of... Jeremiah, there you go, that's good. You guys are quick today. And uh, Jeremiah tells Zedekiah, hey, I just want to let you know something. You are only in power because this is God's discipline and judgment upon our nation because we have not honored him with the way that we've done life. We haven't been practicing temple worship. We've been in rebellion. We haven't been living for the Lord. He says, so Zedekiah, here's what I need you to do. The Lord has told me that the reason that you're in power is simply, is simply this, so that we can be disciplined. So here's what you need to do. You need to do whatever Nebuchadnezzar tells you. Do not repel, do not rebel, do not revolt, do not rise up in power. Simply take the punishment. We as the nation will take the punishment, we'll learn from it, we'll grow from it, and then God will deliver us from this. So listen to me. Don't try and be the king. Just Submit to the authority and everything's going to be fine. We are being disciplined. Don't try and be a powerful king. Submit. And here's what Zedekiah did. In 2 Chronicles chapter 36, beginning in verse 11, here's what scripture says. It says, Zedekiah was 21 years old when he began to reign. And he reigned 11 years in Jerusalem. And he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord his God. He did not humble himself before Jeremiah the prophet who spoke from the mouth of the Lord. Jeremiah told him, you've got one job, and that is to humble yourself before Nebuchadnezzar and not try and be the king. And if you do it, we're going to be okay. But if you don't, it's not only going to cause you pain, it's going to cause all of us pain. So humble yourselves. Well, what are kings bad at doing? Humbling themselves. What are you bad at doing? Being humble is hard, isn't it? Oh, sure, it, it, it's okay when someone tells us how good we are and we have a false sense of humility and we said, oh, no, 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 no. But to truly humble yourself, To make yourself low in order that Jesus might be lifted up. To surrender and be obedient to what he's called you to do because you don't have to have it your own way because you're not king. It's hard, isn't it? We don't like to be told what to do. Zedekiah here is getting ready to learn a very painful lesson. So instead of doing what Jeremiah told him to do, he did what he wanted. So here's what happens. Nebuchadnezzar, in response to him doing what he wanted, sends a small army, a small portion of the army. In fact, if you look at verse 13 here, here's what takes place. It says that Zedekiah also rebelled against King Nebuchadnezzar, who had made him swear by God. 
He stiffened his neck and hardened his heart against turning to the Lord, the God of Israel. He is hard. He said, God, I know what you want me to do. I know that you've used your prophet Jeremiah to tell me what to do. And you know what I'm not going to do? Any of that. I'm going to rule this place. I'm the boss. You're not the boss. He's not the boss. I'm the king. And so here's what Nebuchadnezzar does. He sends a very small portion of his army. Tiny. Small. Small portion of army. You have to remember something, though. It's only been a few years at this point. It's only been a few years since Nebuchadnezzar sent an army down, decimated a city, decimated a temple, took their king, took him out, put him in a king's court, and made him dance around for Nebuchadnezzar. It's only been a few years. How quickly sometimes we forget the lessons that God has taught us and we decide to do the same stupid things all over again, right? And so here's Zedekiah, and he's saying, man, you know what? I'm going to do it on my own. So King Nebuchadnezzar takes this small army, and he sends them down, and he tries to get their attention. So Zedekiah gets scared. He goes to Jeremiah and says, Jeremiah, what should we do? What should we do? They're right out there. They're going to attack us. How do we respond? What are we going to do? What, what happened? I thought everything was good. And Jeremiah said, listen, you didn't listen to me. In fact, you're kind of on the last syllable of the one, two, three. That's where you're at, Zedekiah. You're at through. You need to pay attention. God is trying to get your attention. He says, here's what you need to do. You need to humble yourself. You need to open up the city gates. And you need to go outside. You need to go outside the city gates and you need to come into contact with King Nebuchadnezzar and this small portion of his army. You need to fall on your knees, fall on your knees and beg for forgiveness. You need to beg for your life and the life of your family and for the lives of the people that you are king over. You need to beg because your lack of humility, your selfish pride has gotten us into this and you need to beg. And Jeremiah says this, if you do it, Zedekiah, if you go and you beg for your life, if you beg, here's what's going to take place. They're going to spare you. They're going to spare your family. I guarantee you they will spare your life. They will spare your family's life. It will save the people and all will go well. Just go out, humble yourself, and surrender, surrender. And what does Zedekiah say in response? I'm not doing that. I am the king. So what happens? A few, day go, a few days go by, and the army actually packs up and leaves. And we find Zedekiah, and he's rejoicing. He's like, this is the greatest thing ever. See, I told you, Jeremiah. I told you they weren't going to attack us. They're not dumb enough to attack us. Look at me. Look at the Israelite army. We could take them. And he's mouthing. You know how we all get when we get out by the skin of our teeth and then no one can hear us anymore, right? You better not turn around, right? You know what I'm saying? Like, the army leaves, and, and they're gone. Zedekiah says, see, we're fine. And Jeremiah says, no. We're not fine. They're coming back. Zedekiah, God has given you a second chance. He has given you a second chance. You need to surrender. Can I ask you something this morning? How many of you have maybe been just like Zedekiah where God has told you to do something and you've said no? And rather than God disciplining you in a very harsh manner at that point. He's given you a second chance. Maybe you're here this morning and this is your second chance. Can I tell you something? You need to surrender. You need to surrender. So what happened? What happened here? Why did the army leave? Well, here's the cool part. Because... All that we know about this time is not just necessarily found in God's word, but this is actually a historical account. You can actually look in world history and find out what happened. Well, here's what happened. When the Babylonians, their small portion of army was encamped around Judah, here's what took place. The Egyptians thought, man, this is the perfect time to attack Babylon. Some of their army's gone. They thought they were going to send more. And so the Egyptians came up on the backside and they tried to flank the Babylonians. Well, Nebuchadnezzar said, hey guys, 
Time to get back. Quit playing with the little Israelites. We gotta attack the Egyptians. And so his army left, and he and they had to go fight the Egyptians, all the other. That's actually what took place. Check it out. It, it, it's amazing. You can look in world history and find this. So here's what happens. Jeremiah keeps telling Zedekiah that it needs to repent. You've ever had a person in your life like that that tells you that the way you're living isn't honoring to God? And you tell them you're just fine and they won't shut up about it. Anyone ever had a friend like that? <laughs> Don't point at your spouse this time. This is wrong. Don't do it. Right. Praise the Lord for those friends. Praise the Lord for spouses who do not allow their significant other off the hook when they're living a life that is not obedient to the Lord. Praise the Lord for parents who still fight for their children. Amen. Praise the Lord that some of you are still fighting in the trenches and you haven't said it's not worth the struggle. It's always worth the struggle. It's always worth the struggle when you're talking about the fact that there are people that are being disobedient to the Lord and you realize that rebellion is ultimately going to equal pain in their life. Sometimes we're like, well, I just can't help them anymore. They're a grown adult. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? That's the same way as knowing the truth about the gospel of Jesus and not telling people. It's like having a cure to cancer and watching someone die of cancer because you won't offer them the cure. At the end of the day, if you know that someone needs Jesus, you need to tell them about Jesus. How much you have to hate them and not tell them about Jesus. And if you know someone that claims to be a follower of the Lord and they're living a life that's not obedient to the Lord, then I don't care if you have to jump in front of a bus to tell them. Get in their face and tell them enough is enough. Your rebellion will equal pain. Because what does a surrendered, obedient life to God look like? What can God do with that person? And some of you are like, oh, that sounds really hard. It is. And I just want to let you know that the same thing might happen to you that kind of happened to Jeremiah. Jeremiah wouldn't shut up about it. He said, I told you to repent. You need to repent. You need to bow. You need to bow before Nebuchadnezzar. You need to tell him that you were wrong, that you shouldn't have done it. Remember, this is not about you. It's not about your pride. It's not about how strong you are, how great a leader you are. This is God's discipline in our life. Bow before him. Repent of the horrible things that you've done when you've not been obedient to the Lord. And if you do, you'll live. And so Jeremiah is just saying, repent. Repent. And so Zedekiah, like a lot of us, when we have someone that is speaking things in our life that we don't like, he, we want to shut them up. And he had the power and authority to shut Jeremiah up. So you want to know what he did? He took Jeremiah and they put him in a well. They dropped this prophet of God down in a well. And you want to know what Jeremiah did? He shut up. No, he didn't. He just started yelling from a well. Repent! People are walking by going, that's a talking well. That's like, repent. Like the same thing over and over, repent, repent. And, and, and gosh, I mean, Zedekiah's getting so angry. So they're like, man, if you won't shut up, we'll shut you up. So they pull him out of the well, and they take him, and they put him in prison. And they put him in, in, in a block prison. So he can't yell anymore. They shut him up. Can't hear him anymore. They've got it covered. Everything's good. Zedekiah says, here's the deal. Jeremiah, you're out of my life. I don't have to hear your nonsense anymore. You don't have to tell me how bad I am or how I'm not surrendered to the Lord because that's how it works, right? If people aren't telling you that you're not living a life obedient to the Lord, then you're okay, right? It's not the fact that you don't know that you're being disobedient. If someone's not telling you, it's fine. You can just ignore it. You ever felt like you're living a life in such a way that um, you feel like you can't pray? Like you feel like you, you can't go to church? Like you feel like you can't open God's word and read your Bible? That's called conviction. And it comes from the Holy Spirit. And when Zedekiah felt conviction from Jeremiah, he threw him in a well. And when that didn't work, he threw him in prison. Because we hate to be confronted with our own failures. Because ultimately it means that God is calling us to life change. And life change hurts. And we have to be willing to say that we're not king. And we have to lay down our pride. So they put him in prison. Jeremiah's in prison. Everything's good. One day Zedekiah's standing there. He looks out the window. What's he see? The army's back. And they didn't bring a small portion this time. They brought the whole shebang. The entire Babylonian army has now come and encamped around Judah. And you say, well, what do you mean? Like they came to fight? No, no, no. They didn't come to fight. They actually um, 
set up what are called siege walls. They made big circles of people and camps all the way around the city, 360 degrees, multiple levels of them. So you have the city of Jerusalem, and then you have siege wall, siege wall, siege wall. No one can come in, and no one can come out. In fact, Scripture tells us that these people were, oh boy, Scripture tells us that they had the siege wall set up for two years. For two years, they encamped on the city and set up siege walls while they waited for the people inside to starve to death and die. All because a king by the name of Zedekiah, in rebellion against God, decided that he would not be obedient and listen. It's not a story. It's history. You can look it up. So what happens? Everyone around Zedekiah is dying. So finally, he goes to the prison. He says, Jeremiah, you got to help me. you got to help me. What do we do here? He says, Jeremiah, I need you to pray. You're a prophet of God. So if you just pray, if you get on your knees and you pray earnestly that God will deliver us, then he will. So would you just pray? And Jeremiah says, what any good prophet of the Lord would say right then, he says, no, I'm not praying. I told you what you needed to do. I don't need to pray about it. It was from the Lord. I don't need to pray anymore. You haven't done what you're supposed to do. We don't need to pray about how God would change his mind. You need to cry out and change your mind. I'm not changing. I can't tell you how many times over the years I've had people that have come to me that, that are living in, in just blatant outward sin. They claim to be followers of Jesus, but their life isn't surrendered to the Lord, and, and there can be all types of ways for that, and we're not going to go into all those things. But a lot of these people come to me, and they'll say, hey, um, would you just pray that God would bless our family? And, I, and I'll say, yeah, absolutely, but um, can you tell me, is there any area of your life that you know that you're being willfully disobedient to the Lord? And they'll say, yeah, well, this and this. And I'll say, well, until you do that, there's really no reason for me to pray. Because at the end of the day, Romans 12, 1 and 2 tells us what? To not conform any longer to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you can test and approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Don't conform to the pattern of the world. Don't live like the rest of the people in the world do. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Listen to the Lord. Put His practices into practice. Then, after you do that, then and only then can you test and improve what God's will is, his good, his pleasing, and his perfect will. And so when those people come to me and say, will you pray? I go, no, I won't. Will you trust and be obedient? And many times they say no and say, well, it sounds like we're in an impasse. Because you want to know what I don't want to do? Give them a false assurance of hope. That they can live a life that's disobedient to the Lord, but if they pray enough, that God's just going to bless them anyway. God is not a magic genie. He is not a Santa Claus. He is not a fairy. And his goal in life is not to see how happy he can make you. It's to see how holy he can make you. Happiness and holiness are two entirely different things. And in this world, everyone thinks that God's job is to make them happy. It's not. It's to make you holy. And the only way you're going to do that is by saying, I'm not the king and surrendering to his will for your life. So Zedekiah goes to Jeremiah and says this. What do we do? Will you pray for me? Jeremiah says no. And then in 2 Kings chapter, chapter 25, verses 1 and 2, here's what scripture says. And in the ninth year of his reign, in the, twelfth, in the sorry, in the tenth month, and on the tenth day of the month, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came with all of his army against Jerusalem, and they laid siege to it, and they built siege walls all around it. So the city was besieged till the eleventh year of the king. Do you see the two years? Eleven years. They laid siege to this area. That's what happened. So how does this story play out? What happens after they've laid siege? What, what's the hope for Zedekiah? What happens when he asks Jeremiah to pray and Jeremiah says no? Well, here's the amazing thing about Scripture. A lot of times we think it's just um, these fictitious uh, storybooks that we're supposed to learn some stuff out of, like an Aesop's fable. But here's the deal. Um, it's literal and it's actual in, in many cases. And so if you go to the book of Jeremiah, I don't know why my phone is beeping, by the way. Um, if you go to the book of Jeremiah chapter 38, 
you will find um, this account continued because it's talking about Jeremiah. And if you go to Jeremiah chapter 38, verses uh, 17 and 18, here's what scripture says. It says, Then Jeremiah said to Zedekiah, Thus says the Lord, the God of hosts, the God of Israel, If you will surrender to the officials of the king of Babylon, then your life shall be spared, and this city shall not be burned with fire, and you and your house shall live. But if you do not surrender to the officials of the king of Babylon, then this city shall be given into the hand of the Chaldeans, and they shall burn it with fire, and you shall not escape their hand. So he tells them, Zedekiah, as you do in this instance, so not only does it go with your life, but also with the lives of all of the people that live in your city. Mom and dad, as you do, so goes it not only for your life, but also for the lives of the people that live in your household. Residents of Moberly, and Cairo, and Huntsville, and the surrounding communities who claim to be the body of Christ, yet look nothing like the body of Christ at times, as we, as the church, do, so goes it in the kingdom of God. Here's what verse 21 says. To verse 20, sorry. Jeremiah said, You shall not be given to them. Obey now the voice of the Lord and what I say to you, and it shall be well with you, and your life shall be spared. He is begging Zedekiah to get in line with what God's telling him. And then verse 21 says this, But if you refuse to surrender, it is one of the most pointed Portions in all of Scripture. But if you refuse to surrender. It's an incredible story. In fact, wouldn't this make a great Hollywood movie? You've got armies and siege walls. You've got internal struggle. You've got pride leading to the downfall of someone. You have all of these things. You have famine. You have fighting. The reality is this. It sounds a lot like life for us, doesn't it? You and I, many times in life, we want to be king. It leads us to problems. We know the enemy's gathered outside. We know he's a roaring lion and he wants to steal, kill, and destroy. And we don't want to surrender to God. We don't want to surrender. It's not just that he's talking to Zedekiah, it's that he's talking to me. It's that he's talking to you. It's that he's talking to your spouse. It's that he's talking to your children. He's talking to your family. He's talking to your friends. He's talking to your neighbors. God wants their heart. You see, you have to understand something. That God wasn't punishing the Israelites out of anger. Everyone look at me. God wasn't punishing the Israelites out of anger. That is not what was happening here. He was disciplining them to get their attention. He wanted their attention. And because Zedekiah was scared of the consequences, because he was scared of the consequences of his sin, because he was more scared of the consequences of his sin than he was moved by a holy God, he continued to be disobedient. And here's what happened, and I didn't put it on the screen for you. I just want to read it for you. In 2 Kings chapter 25, Verses 3 through 7, here's what scripture says about Zedekiah and how it ended up for him. And on the ninth day of the fourth month, the famine was so severe in the city that there was no food for the people of the land. And then a breach was made in the city, and all of the men of war fled by night by the wall of the gate, between the two walls, by the king's garden, and the Chaldeans were all around the city. And they went in the direction of Arabah. But the army of the Chaldeans pursued the king and overtook him in the plains of Jericho. And all of his army was scattered from him. 
And then they captured the king and brought him up to the king of Babylon at Riblah, and they passed sentence on him. Can you see what's going on with Zedekiah? He wouldn't be obedient, so what's he do? He pucks out and runs without his people. He takes off by cover of night, and he runs like the scared little boy that he was. Instead of facing what God had called him to do, he took off under cover of night, and he ran. And he said, I'm not dealing with it. And they catch him. Verse 7, it says, They slaughtered the sons of Zedekiah before his eyes. So they captured him and his family. They brought his sons around. And they slaughtered him. And then, after watching his sons be slaughtered, they gouged his eyes out. So the last thing he saw was the death of his sons because of his disobedience. And they bound him in chains, and they took him to Babylon. It's dramatic. It's gory. Why in the world does Scripture tell this story? Why? It seems so mean. It seems so heartless. Why do we have to read about accounts like these? God wasn't trying to pay his disobedient people back. Hear me. He was trying to win them back. God is never trying to pay you back. He's trying to win you back. Especially if you are a follower of Jesus. Scripture says that there is no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. And so when you mess up, he's not trying to pay you back. He's not trying to punish you for something that you've done. Are you kidding me? He's trying to win you back. He's trying to say you are mine. You're my bride. You're my children. I love you. He's not trying to pay you back. He's not mad at you. There's nothing you can do to ever make God love you less or make God love you more. It doesn't work like that. That is all provided in Jesus. He's not trying to pay you back. He's trying to win you back. That's what he wants to do. Why? Why would he try and win them back? Here's why. Because they belong to him. They were his people. They belonged to him. Can I tell you something this morning? You belong to him. You are his. He's not mad at you. And he's not trying to pay you back. He's trying to win you back. And the reason that God goes to such great lengths to win you back is because you belong to to him. Listen to me very carefully. The reason that you got caught, the reason your wife or husband found out, the reason the letter that no one else was supposed to see was read, the reason the boss caught you, or the IRS caught you, or the police caught you, the reason you secret sin was found out is not because God is trying to pay you back. It's because he's trying to win you back. He's trying to capture your heart. The reason is not because God is mad at you. It's because he is pursuing you. God disciplines those that he loves. And God went after Israel because they belong to him. And he goes after you because you belong to him. And he knows what's best for you. He knows what's best for you far more and far better than you do or than I do. I just want you to understand something about God's love to you. Look at this. God did not spare his own son to gain your salvation, and he will not spare your health, he will not spare your wealth, he will not spare your marriage or your career to get your attention. Let me say it again, because I think somewhere along the way the American church has forgotten this one. 
God did not spare even his own son to gain your salvation. So there is no way in the world that he's going to spare your health, your wealth, your marriage, or your career just so that you can be comfortable and so that you can be happy and so that he doesn't get your attention. That's not what God does. Let me ask you something. Is there anything that God won't do to get your attention? Is there anything that God won't do to get your heart? There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. What is there in the world that God will not break down to get your heart, to get your attention? The Apostle John said it this way in Revelation 3, verses 19 and 20. Words of Jesus not recorded anywhere else. John pens them for us. Those whom I love, I reprove, and I discipline. So be zealous, and let's all say it together, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and I knock. He's not knocking because he can't get in. Hear me. He's not knocking because he can't get in. He's knocking because he's waiting for you to finally say yes. He's knocking because he's waiting for you to finally open the door because you're scared. And you know if you open the door that it's gonna, it's gonna mean life change. It's gonna mean surrender. And it's going to mean you're going to have to get on your knees and say, I'm not king, but you are king. And he's going to keep knocking. He's going to keep knocking. And he's not going to spare your health or your wealth or your marriage. He's not going to spare any of it in order to get your attention because he only wants you. And some of you right now are going through turmoil and you're saying, why? And God's saying, listen to me this morning. I'm knocking. I've been knocking for years and you just don't get it. You still think you can do this on your own. You still think that you are sufficient enough that you can live in a John Wayne society where you can pull up your own bootstrap and you can take care of stuff. Men of God, let me tell you something. God doesn't give a rip about your bootstrap. You can't do it on your own. And it's the biggest lie to hurt the American church in centuries. God doesn't need people that can do it on their own. God needs people who say, I'm dependent on you to do it all. And I trust in you. And because I love you, God says, I want you to repent. And here's the deal. For many of you, as we're talking this morning, you know what this one thing is, don't you? You can't hide. Some of you are saying, holy cow, my wife must have told you, and she probably wrote the outline for the sermon for you, didn't she? <laughs> no. You want to know why I know how you can't hide? Because I can't hide either. You want to know why Angela had to sit up here for 45 minutes this morning and uh, put all brand new scriptures in this sermon? Because on Wednesday evening, God broke my heart and made me change it. Because what I had for you was really good info. It was really funny, good slides. And you would have left here feeling great. And it, and it wasn't at all what God wanted to say to your heart. Listen to me. This morning, unless you finally surrender, you're going to keep playing this merry-go-round game over and over and over again. And because God loves you, life is going to be harder and harder and harder and harder because you won't surrender. It's not because he doesn't love you, because he loves you so much. Many of you know what the one thing is. 
here in a moment, we're going to have a time of invitation where we invite you to do business with the Lord. And some of you guys know exactly what that business is. Some of you guys, you need to leave church today and you need to go home. You need to have a long talk with a spouse about some things that you've done. And you say, I don't want to have the talk. The talk's going to be hard. You're right. It's going to be hard and it's going to hurt. But how much more does it hurt if you don't have the talk? Some of you, you're living with someone that you have no business living with. And God has told you time and time again to get out. And you won't do it because it's hard and it's uncomfortable. But unless you surrender, surrender. Some of you, you need to get rid of the electronic device that is ruling your life. And that is causing you so much distraction from Jesus or literally pulling you away from Jesus by the things that you see on its screen. You need to surrender and throw that thing in the lake. Some of you need to remove certain people from your life and surrender. And some of you, the surrender you need to make is you need to let certain people in your life. And you're scared because you're introverted and it scares you to have people in your business. And I get it. But God didn't create you to do life alone. He actually doesn't even give you the option to do so. It's why he never said, go ye therefore and become hermits and live on lots of land in the country where no one can get to you. And lo, I am with you always until the very end of the age. Some of you have behaviors in your life know that it's calling you to let go of and you won't. And they have no place in your life. And you continue to make excuses for why they're there. There's just one problem. All you're making are excuses. Some of you, you have made money your God and God is calling you to surrender. Some of you have made relationships your God and he's calling you to surrender. Some of you, you want to know what you, want to, what you need to surrender? You need to surrender your life to Jesus. Because you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that even as I sit here and talk, that you have no relationship with God, that your sins have never been forgiven by Jesus. You have never, in a step of faith and trust, said, Jesus, would you take away my sin? I repent of the life that I'm living, and I'm choosing to follow you, no looking back. And maybe that's the surrender you need to make this morning. So you got two choices this morning. You can choose to say, God, I know what you want me to do. And I'm going to say no. Because I'm king. Or you can say yes. And invite God to be the king of the throne room of your heart. Today, church... I think some of us have some real business to do with the Lord. I think some of us have some real surrender that needs to take place. Church, you want to know what surrender looks like? It looks like you being so much less concerned with what the people around you think and so much more concerned with what your Heavenly Father thinks. You want to know why... Many people raise their hands when they sing. And I'm not saying you need to raise your hands when you sing. I don't most of the time. But you want to know why they do? It's not to be seen. It's an act of surrender. 